All right, thanks for the introduction, Omri. Um, so in general, the goal of this talk, I'll sort of, I think most of you are actually experts on the techniques already. I want to focus on sort of presenting what the implications of the techniques mean in terms of privacy or cryptography. And they have somewhat surprising implications at times when you can use certain techniques and stuff. All right, so let's get started. Um, so before I begin, I gotta tell you guys what a cryptographic data structure is, so I'll do that, and I'll tell you guys what it means to be private and so forth, specifically for this area. And then in general, I'm just gonna go through a bunch of sort of uh, techniques through dynamic, read-only, and sort of maybe succinct uh, lower bounds and show them how they can actually be applied to various problems in cryptography. All right, so let's get started. And what are cryptographic data structures? So, all right, I, I'm gonna, simplify what a data structure really is. This isn't really right, but anyways, let's do it. Usually you can view a data structure sort of as you have some sort of computing chip and some RAM. Long story short, the computing chip gets some query, wants to do a bunch of accesses to the RAM to get some data. All right, this is not all encompassing, I know that, but it's a good way for me to sort of take you guys into the land of cryptography. So what we do with the land of cryptography essentially is we sort of assume that this RAM is untrusted. So there's some adversary that lives here and what it can do is it'll see everything on the RAM. So what it'll do is it'll see, for example, what the, what the memory contents are and what is being accessed, all the timings and everything. And what happens instead is now we assume that this CPU is actually trusted. So to do cryptography, we need some component that's trusted. So we'll assume here is trusted and has a bunch of, you know, it can store private keys and whatever. So in general, I think the original motivation of this was, called, was by Goldreich and Ostrovsky called Oblivious Rams. And what they assumed was you can, you can have a minimal assumption on the, on the computation, right? You assume the small piece of CPU is trusted via whatever various things, and the rest of the memory is untrusted or sort of compromised. Uh, so this was introduced in like the 90s. It's a little old, so I like a different approach, what I call the cloud approach, which is probably much more relevant today. So you can sort of replace the CPU with your favorite personal device, let's say your phone or your laptop, and we can assume that these things are in your control. Okay, there's some things about malware and whatever, but they're trusted. And the RAM instead is your favorite cloud storage system. You're going to try to outsource data. You may not trust whoever, is being, whoever you're outsourcing this to, and you want to make sure you obtain privacy. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to assume all the cryptographic data structures in this sort of model. OK, so now that we have sort of this two-party idea, what should we protect, right? That's the next step. What do we want to keep private? Uh, the most natural thing usually to think about is, OK, we have the contents of the data structure, and let's keep that private. You know, so what happens is, Maybe I have my, my laptop, I'm uploading my favorite documents to some cloud storage system, and I want to make sure that the data is private so the adversary can't see it. Uh, this is actually a really easy problem to solve. You know, we keep a symmetric key locally, we encrypt everything before it's uploaded, and simultaneously, whenever we want to download a document, we simply download the ciphertext and decrypt it. All right, so I'm done. That's all my talk. Uh, no, actually not really. So that's easy, that's easy, and uh, this, is, this is not the problem that we want to solve. It turns out there's something more subtle that ends up being much more challenging to, to sort of protect, and this is the whole area that this works on, uh, the, the whole field that everyone tries to work on. And it's sort of protecting the queries that are performed on the data structure. So, so we can protect the contents really easily, but can we also protect what's happening on the data structure? Can we make sure that whatever actions or behavior the sort of uh, user device is doing, can that be protected from the adversary? And the simplest example I like to give is the following. Let's look at this. You know, let's suppose that on different days, I, I sent a request. So the first set of requests I send are two, you know, maybe Monday and Tuesday, I sent a request for the blue ciphertext. The adversary doesn't know it's a blue ciphertext, it doesn't know what's in it, but it knows that it's, this ciphertext is being requested twice. In contrast, I could instead have sent a request for a blue and a purple document on different days. And again, the, the adversary doesn't know what's inside these documents, but it can quickly tell and differentiate between these two sort of actions. And in general, if you're not careful, in fact, you can sort of see access patterns. So essentially, you can literally see how data is accessed, and this could be very dangerous in general. And this is what we all, this is the whole area of trying to solve cryptographic data structures. Um, okay, so this is what we're gonna try to hide. Um, not sure this is interesting, but this has some real-world applications. At Google, we've sort of launched various things that have used these things, including password checkup and device enrollment. Um, I don't know if you guys are interested in this. I can talk about it more, but let's, I feel like let's move on to the lower bounds. Um, all right, so now that I hope everyone got the idea about the model, what I'm going to start off with is sort of 
taking a lot of the techniques that Hua Cheng presented in, earlier, I guess, on Monday, and sort of show you how they're used to prove lower bounds for cryptography. And in fact, what we're actually doing is usually what you, what you try to do is you can, you can take a harder problem, use the properties of it to get a higher lower bound. Here, what we're doing is taking simpler problems, using privacy guarantees to get higher lower bounds instead. Can, mm -hmm. Could you give us one example, before you give us lower bounds, of a positive example of such a like a construction, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to start off with that actually. So I'll, I'll do the I'll do the upper bounds first, and I'll sort of show you from this how you prove lower bounds. So I'll give you I'll give this to you. So let's start off. What's the simplest data structure you can imagine? An just array. Go like when you want to access X, just access everything. Yep. So let's let's do an array, right? That's the simplest thing, and this is what's called oblivious RAM essentially. So how does this work essentially? Uh, like I said, that you know your device will have some sort of private state or private key. You sort of outsource an array, literally just an array to the server. And the goal is simply something like, I want to read the first block. Right? But you have to do this. So OK, in plain text, this is one probe. Life's easy. In the oblivious world, this is actually a problem that's been studied for 30 years. And, we do, and it took a while for us to figure it out. But what we have to do is something far more complicated. Because right? we can't just access that block to get the answer. And we have to do something, and what usually ends up happening is, is not only do you have to read something, and this sort of interaction is complex to get the response, but even more complicated is that you have to actually refresh your, your, your key after every operation. And not only that, the data is shuffled. So what's happening is that not only to, to, to make sure you obtain obliviousness, you have to do very complicated things and continuously update and refresh both the keys and the data being stored in some ordering to make sure this works. So, OK, so this is what is called the oblivious RAM. So let me talk about what, OK, I, mean, I should also count that. You can also write, because we're doing dynamic dual rounds. So you can, you can do a read or a write of some uh, sort of cell. Um, OK, so in terms of what oblivious RAM security provides, we, there's a pretty long definition with an adversary. But long story short, what you really want is for any two sequences of the same length, right? The adversary or whatever the, whoever's storing the data or the encrypted data should not be able to distinguish between the two operations, between the two operational sequences. And the operational sequences can differ in any way they want. And can distinguish here means computationally or statistically? Good. So yeah, okay, let me I have a slide for that, so I'll come back to that. But just to make sure what everyone what, what we talk about here, uh, the adversary's view is this, right? So it's it's all the interactions and it's all the data and encryption and you know it's sort of the memory at any point in time, not just the memory currently. Like a good question. So there are two types of adversaries that we were. to One question uh, on the server side. Does mm -hmm. the adversary see the boundary between different? Uh, <coughs> yes. Okay. That's a good question. Um, the answer in this results are yes, but it turns out that if you don't want to see it, it makes life more challenging. So the lower bounds are slightly weaker. I think there was a result by Hubachek and all that that studied this. So uh, that's a good question. And throughout this whole talk, we will know the boundaries. Um, okay. So then, okay. The other question we have is there are two types of adversaries that are typically studied. One is computational, so it runs in probabilistic polynomial time, essentially expected polynomial time. And statistical ones are essentially adversaries that have unlimited power. They can run whatever they want. And uh, the way I've written it was for computational adversaries, but in fact, if you use statistical adversaries, you typically use statistical distance to measure sort of uh, privacy or security. Unless I say otherwise, everything in this talk will be computational. And of course, uh, that's a stronger adversary, so if I prove lower bounds here, they definitely apply over there. OK, so yep, computational adversaries. And uh, like I said, I think I mentioned here, this is written for computational, but you can rewrite all of this in terms of statistical distance to get, a, to get the right bound to get for, for statistical adversaries. Um, OK, so this is sort of uh, the question that you asked for upper bounds. So just for the array problem, it was actually proposed earlier than 96. This was actually the journal paper. I think it was proposed in the 80s, this specific problem. And it took us almost 30 years to find that the right bound is actually log n. And it's, it, there's a pretty long process and a lot of work. So it turns out for about two decades, no one worked on the problem. But around 2011 until now, there's been a large increase of work in this, in this area. And the best uh, sort of construction is log n. It sort of says it's optimal, so I gave away the lower bound. But sort of that's, that's what it takes. So one thing you can view is sort of, if you, do, if you think of a plain text access and an array, it's one probe. That's logarithmic in this sort of, uh, sort of world when so you like want to log n here is like, is the, o, is the, o, is the overhead 
Yep, yep. So if you have one probe, if you want to read one entry, you sort of need to compile that into log n normal accesses or normal probes. And here, n is the size of the array, not the sequence. All right, so this is the, this is the upper bounds. I'm not going to go into it. I'm going to talk more about the lower bounds here. So in the seminal work by Casper, actually, a couple of years ago, I think it won best paper at crypto, um, we were able to actually, this was, I think, the first result that sort of took cell probe lower bounds and applied them to these data structures. So in this work, essentially, it was shown that I think the results came out almost simultaneously that oblivious RAMs require omega log n overhead. So that in other words, the construction back here is tight. OK, so how do we do this? I think this is the one technique that Hua Cheng didn't cover. So I guess I'll help her cover a bit more. And it's called information transfer, and it was by Petrascu and Domain in 2004. Uh, there are relations to chronogram, I think. I don't remember exactly, but anyways, I'll, we'll, we'll go through with this information transfer. So this technique is a, is a little bit different than what was done in the past for the chronogram. It's, a, it's for dynamic data structures. And at a very high level, what you're going to do is, is sort of build a binary tree. But you're going to assign each of the operations to the, to the leaf nodes in order. So for example, operation one is the first operation, operation two, and so forth. And they come according to time. So what happens is if you look at it, if you look in a little more detail, each of these operations consists of cell reads and cell writes, right? That's, you know, they have an operation I want to read, you know, I want to do a near neighbor search. It actually ends up being compiled into a bunch of cell reads and cell writes. And what information transfer does is it goes through this list and takes every cell read, finds the most recent write to that, to that cell, if it exists. If it doesn't, we'll ignore them. And what it does is it's going to take the two sort of, you know, it's assigned or sort of related to two leaf nodes, and then find the lowest common ancestor. And for this low and com lowest common ancestor, I'm going to assign this cell probe here. Right? So what's going to end up happening is every cell probe will be uniquely assigned to an internal node. Right? So uh, why is this interesting? It turns out that this is actually a way of, well, exactly as the name says, of trying to sort of characterize the amount of information transferred between operations. So let's take a look and you know, what's going to happen is each of these internal nodes will have a list of cell probes that are, that are sort of assigned to it. right? And these are all like cell, like cell addresses. And it's not hard to actually see that this is, all the inform this, this is exactly characterizing all the information that's transferred from, I guess, the subtree above to the subtree below. So what that means is if there's any information that operations in the lower subtree of this that's rooted at this node needs, they have to, it, has to, it has to be read from a cell probe that was assigned to this node. So uh, let me quickly sketch why. To do this, typically, we can just you know, look at other nodes. Let's suppose we look at all the cell probes assigned to this node. You can quickly see that, well, actually, none of the future operations have occurred yet. Right? So no cells here can actually be transferred to subtrees, to operations in the subtree below. And same thing for above, it turns out almost the same thing. Well, what's happening is are these cell probes are actually being sort of operated on or, or read over there. And if, if they're read later, they're not read here. So for example, if it was assigned here, it had to be read here. It can't be used to sort of uh, you know, characterize the information being transferred. So in fact, all the cell probes here essentially are, is characterizing the information transferred from the top subtree to the bottom subtree. And how you do this formally is you typically show that there's some encoding scheme, right? So what you can do is essentially say, take the set of probes assigned here and all of its contents and its addresses. And you can come up with an encoding scheme that essentially shows that you know, whatever information is recovered from the bottom subtree that's from the top subtree, it's, in, it's enough to sort of, uh, sort of retrieve that information. I won't go through the encoding formally because it's very similar to the ones that Hua Cheng has done from last uh, on Monday. OK, so this is the technique. And what do we do, let's say, non-obliviously? Let's say we're doing a normal, a normal data structure, lower bound without cryptography. Well, what we have to do is sort of find a hard distribution that essentially aims to maximize the assigned probes to all internal nodes simultaneously. So for example, this is, very, this is possible. And it was actually done originally for like partial sums using, I don't know if it's like, this, I don't know if you guys have seen this bit reversal sort of distribution. But in fact, I think the easiest way to describe such, such an idea is actually through polynomial evaluation. Because for example, it's not actually very hard for me to create a distribution that actually enables this for polynomial evaluation, 
simply because I don't care what, what evaluation results I get. If I, as long as, let's say if I have a k-degree polynomial, if I get enough evaluations of it, I can sort of uh, interpolate and retrieve the whole polynomial, regardless of whatever I updated above. So in fact, I think this is why Hua Cheng chose polynomial evaluation. It's one of the easiest sort of uh, problems for which you can actually uh, construct hard distributions. But OK, remember what we're doing here. We're, we're, we're doing an array. I, don't, I wouldn't know how to do a hard distribution. Like, there is no hard distribution. We can't do it. Like, if I could, I could prove a log n lower bound for array. Right? So I actually, like, this is where we get stuck if we try to do something straightforward without new techniques. I think this is what Casper and Jesper showed is that, in fact, there's actually this new idea where you can sort of leverage obliviousness to sort of stitch together distributions. So for an array, it's not hard to find certain distributions that can actually maximize the probes assigned to certain internal nodes. So for example, the one I've written here, which sort of writes to the first index and then reads from the first index, it's not hard to see that this maximizes the sort of information transfer for these uh, nodes. Right? And I can do this again. So now if I wanted to maximize this one, I find another distribution. I just want to maximize these nodes. And one more time. Right? So this is the key point, essentially. Because of obliviousness, sort of, it's actually not hard to for, for a, po a polynomial time adversary to calculate the size of these, like how many cell probes are assigned to each of these nodes. Right? So even if I want to do something as stupid as this, this is a really stupid distribution. Right? I'm not even reading or writing. Because of privacy and because of the fact that sort of all of these, so sort of the adversary can actually compute this tree in polynomial time, it better be that to ensure, for, to ensure that sort of this, this, and this all look different from this, you have to actually sort of make sure that the data structure assigns enough cells to each of these internal nodes. In other words, what we've really done here is use privacy. We take a problem that's really easy for which we definitely can't find a hard distribution that maximizes all of them, and then sort of found three different distributions and stitched them all together to show that actually, you know, we can actually prove a logarithmic lower bound. Um, does that make sense? So if, if anyone wants to know why it's a logarithmic lower bound, you can sort of see that essentially, let's say four probes will have to be assigned here. Oops. Two probes will be assigned here each and so forth, something like this. And then if you, if you add them up, all the cell probes are sort of uh, partitioned. They're, in the, they're uniquely assigned to each cell, to each sort of internal node. So the sum becomes n log n total for, for, n, for n operations. Um, all right. Uh, so does that make sense? Any questions? All right. So it turns out that after this work, there's been several works that show sort of use the information transfer technique to prove lower bounds for a variety of oblivious data structures, including stacks, queues, deeks, and uh, I think there's also priority queues and search trees that, that Casper worked on. Something called searchable encryption, you can actually end up proving lower bounds for this. Uh, Multi-server oblivious RAMs, where the idea is sort of, in, in, th in this sort of previous model, we had assumed that the single server was compromised by the adversary, but you can sort of split them up and assume adversaries are like only maybe half of them are compromised or something. As well as like there's some, I think in the original Petrascu and Domain, they had some tricks of actually handling smaller word size even to the bit probe model, and that was also adapted for oblivious RAMs. Okay, so this is the information transfer technique. Um, and it's, if you really think about it, compared to the chronogram, in terms of actually without privacy, I, I don't actually know a significant difference between the two. In fact, like if you're proving sort of dynamic lower bounds for close to logarithmic, you can use either, and it turns out information transfer is typically easier to sort of reason with. Uh, but I don't think you can, you can't use it to get log squared and lower bounds. I don't know how to, how to do that. So like in general, what I'm trying to say is that it's not clear to me which one will be usable in, without, without privacy. But it turns out there's a huge difference if you start considering other things. So this is like a standard cryptographic question that we always ask as cryptographers. You know, you guys, maybe people always in, in data structures, you guys ask, what if you had a harder problem or an easier problem? Here we consider, what about weaker privacy notions, right? What if we consider something that's not as strong as an oblivious RAM or, and, try to, and try to figure out what happens to the, to the overhead? Is the lower bound still hold or can you improve the upper bound? So one such problem is, is a natural sort of relaxation from oblivious RAM that we call differentially private RAM. So what is, remember the oblivious RAM, the definition I gave you, it sort of says that any two distributions of equal lengths, or any two uh, sequences of equal lengths, have to be indistinguishable. Right? And this is through like, you know, negligible, the difference has to be negligible to a, a computational adversary. 
What we could also do is now sort of relax this and sort of use notions from differential privacy. I take two sequences, and I let's say they differ in one location, right? And I want to provide strong guarantees for one location, but sort of if the sequences start differing more and more, I want these privacy sort of guarantees to decay exponentially, right? Um, okay, I don't know. Like to be fair, I don't know why this would be useful. It was just a really interesting problem. I thought I, so. Don't ask me like why it would be useful, but it's still very interesting. Um, for the definition, I, so now I'm not sure if for those who understand differential privacy, but we use sort of this what's called epsilon and delta differential privacy, which is sort of the probability of one transcript must be less than or equal to e to the epsilon times another transcript plus sub delta. If you're not familiar, the standard values of, de of epsilon and delta is epsilon should be constant and delta should be about negligible or at least one over polynomial. And the reason we use this sort of weird uh, formula is that, like I said, we want to actually provide guarantees even if sequences differ by more than one operation. So you can actually use something called composability. This is the absolute weakest version of composability. So uh, this is not the best one. I don't think you should use this in general, but it does sort of give you an idea of what you could do, right? Like, so if, if the two sequences differ by at most k operations, sort of the epsilon and delta can multiply by k. And like I said, uh, now as k gets larger, sort of the privacy guarantee you get is exponentially decaying. Um, all right. OK, so now let's go to information transfer and take a look again. So these were two distributions that I had stitched together, sort of that we stitched together in the previous uh, lower bound. Uh, so there's a problem sort of immediately, right? If you look at the two sequences, for oblivious rams, this was fine in the sense that the two sequences differ a lot. Right? Here, they differ by you know, linear. Um, you know, there are some tricks that could make this smaller, but it turns out that even if they started differing, even with like square root n, you, know, you could find distributions that differ only in square root n, that's already too large for the exponentially decaying sort of privacy guarantees of differential privacy. And for this reason, I don't know how to modify the information transfer to be able to sort of solve this problem using for, for differential private RAM. But it turns out that that's, that, OK, so right, I guess this is what I was saying. Essential differential privacy decays exponentially, and information transfer, I think the best one would come up actually has order n differing updates. So OK, so this is a result with one of my colleagues, Pino, and we essentially were able to prove this lower bound using omega log and overhead in the cell probe model. But we had to go back to a slightly older technique, which was the chronogram by Fredman and Sachs. And so I only have one line here, but it's truly crucial, is, the, is that somehow this specific technique enables proving lower bounds for weaker privacy. And the key point actually ends up being that there's only one read at the end. So for the information transfer, you sort of have to prove that information transfers through every subtree. right? For the chronogram, you only really need to prove that all the information transfers to a single read. And what's going to end up happening, so I'm going to sort of give away the ending, is that because it was only one read, all the distributions I need to stitch together will only differ in that read. And this is sort of one interesting implication of the sort of different techniques in, in, the, in the cell probe lower bounds where chronogram and information transfer don't seem to be very different in, in standard and without, without cryptography. But somehow for cryptography, the chronogram ends up being much more powerful. All right, so uh, I guess I'll go through the proof. Um, I think Hua Cheng went through all of this, so I'm going to go quickly. But how the chronogram works is it has sort of end write operations that are broken down to epochs that are exponentially decaying. Um, so what ends up happening is if you look at the chronogram and you sort of see, you sort of take a look at what memory looks like, you can always assign sort of an epoch number to each cell, which is the last epoch that, it was, that overwrote that cell. Wait, wait, wait. So what are the rows and columns of yeah, I, I, oh, oh, this is just, just memory. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just think of these as cells, and I've assigned each cell a number, which is the last epoch it was written in, right? And then, okay, so what we what we can do is let's say I fix an epoch, but let's call it five, just to make it easy. And then you can quickly analyze saying what information can be stored about epoch five, right? Remember, epochs are, are, are exponentially decaying, so you can quickly see that obviously, uh, for any updates in epoch five, clearly any cells that I last overrode in epoch five could store information, and all the epochs that happen afterwards. So uh, for in, I think in, the, in sort of the notation I've chosen here, epochs are going the wrong way. So larger epochs happen first, smaller epochs, or smaller index epochs happen at the end. Um, all right, so 
this is the information that we can sort of uh, accumulate for, for, up, for the updates in, in Epoch 5. And now we can see why the epochs are chosen to be exponentially decaying, is that if this has beta i writes, this contains essentially at most beta i minus 1 sort of updates. In other words, this is, this is pretty small, and it shouldn't be enough if you choose beta correctly, such that this can't write all the information about this, even if it just focuses and tries to. Um, OK, so I guess this, is all, this was all stuff Hua Cheng had went through. So going back now to this problem, uh, yeah, so this is a picture again. So again, we're talking about array accesses, right? Differentially private RAM is a differentially private array. So there's no way I'm going to be able to find a, read, a distribution for read operations that can somehow simultaneously read enough information from all the epochs. That's not possible, and I, I can't do it. But again, like I said, now what we're going to do is sort of find different distributions and stitch them together. So let's start off by picking any epoch i. And it's not hard to see that if you pick the index x chosen uniformly at random from all the overwritten writes from this epoch, you can sort of prove the following. You know, this is what I think Hua Cheng did. It says you have to read at least one cell last overwritten in epoch i for, for, for this distribution. Um, OK, so why? Essentially, you do this again through a formal encoding, but it's, you can sort of show that all the future updates won't be enough to store enough information. So thus, therefore, you have to do this. And then essentially, we're just going to do sort of a, a similar technique here where, so I know how to do this for one epoch. I know how to find one distribution for one epoch. Now I just do it for all the epochs, right? And again, there's a clear important part here that I haven't sort of talked about is that given sort of this, this sequence, it is actually not hard for this, uh, you know, this picture here for an adversary to actually compute this, right? A polynomial time adversary can actually keep track of this table without a problem. So therefore, it knows literally where the epochs are happening. It knows all of the rights information. It knows exactly all the information of the, that we're talking about for the chronogram. And therefore, you know, if we know that there exists some index x that has enough you know, to, to read from, from each of the epochs, then it better be that, the, that this read inf information to sort of hide what x is has to read enough from all the epochs. Right. So, yep, and this is it. Sort of, this must be true for all the epochs, and you sort of stitch them together to, get a low, to, to sort of get the lower bound. All right, so one thing you guys might ask quickly is Hua Cheng proved a log n over log log n lower bound. And I've been telling you log n without any sort of caveats. And the reason for this is actually the simple approach that I've sort of said does give you log n over log log n. Um, and there are additional tricks to obtain log n, which was also uh, presented in the, sort of the ideas were presented in the paper by Petrascu and Domain. And it actually makes the chronogram quite a bit more complicated, but the main issue is that at a very high level, the simple version that we show, it's overly pessimistic in the fact that it assumes all future epochs target a specific epoch, right? A natural data structure cannot do this, right? It can't in any way simultaneously target each of its updates to all of the epochs simultaneously. And to sort of get around this pessimistic assumption, all it, it, there turns out to be a trick where you can sort of, if you assume the way we had done this, we, we, uh, the adversary knows where the epochs are. To simply get around this, all you have to do is pick a number of updates that's random between n and 2n. And then without ever telling the data structure, you simply say, OK, now is when the query comes, and the, and the data structure can't prepare for it. right? The best you can do is sort of guess equally across all the epochs. And sort of that's how you get the log log in back. Um, all right. So it turns out that unlike information transfer as well, there's a neat, there's a neat result that you can also get stronger trade-offs. So for, for information transfer, like, I'm not sure if you can actually do this, but to my knowledge, you can only get a max of TU and TQ. Whereas using the chronogram with these trade-offs, you can actually prove this specific result for, for, uh, for to, to get the read and write trade-offs. In particular, if one of them is, is sub-logarithmic, the other is super-logarithmic. And in fact, it can be much larger, I think, than logarithmic. It actually explodes much higher. Um, any questions? All right. So going back to this, there's a, now we can sort of take a summary of what the chronogram versus information transfer has. Both techniques can obtain omega log n lower bounds. 
Um, I think in general, if you're doing this for non-cryptographic settings, I would suggest using information transfer because it's a lot easier to sort of reason about. The chronogram is much more complicated. And in general, I think this is what ha ends up happening in many cases. Like for example, a lot of the previous lower bounds, whenever they can use information transfer, they do so. But it turns out that chronogram does enable pr proving lower bounds for much weaker privacy, where you only need to stitch sequences of operations that can differ in a constant number of locations. OK, sounds good. Uh, all right, so that was dynamic lower bounds. Um, next, I guess I did this in reverse, watching was starting from static went to dynamic. I'll go from dynamic to sort of static. Uh, so I'll tell you why I said read only here. I'll, I'll get back to it a little later. But in fact, the first thing I wanted to do is actually go back to the chronogram, prove another dynamic lower bound. But OK, it has something related to static because of recall that, so this is, I think this was introduced by Casper in 2012. The way to do this to prove log squared lower bounds dynamically is to actually plug in static lower bounds in each epoch. Right? Here I put tilde because you're losing some log log n factors. Um, but it turns out that, that you know, static lower bounds are actually a critical piece or ingredient to be able to prove log squared and dynamic lower bounds. So OK, so with, uh, with Casper, Omri, as well as Tal at Columbia, we, were actually, we actually were able to use this technique to prove this for a, a lower bound called for, for near neighbor search. OK, so again, uh, I guess cell pro lower bounds are quite low. Near neighbor search, I think, for fine grain, you have much higher lower bounds. But this ends up being quite the highest we can, we can, we can do. So we prove a log squared and overhead using this, using the chronogram plus cell, cell, cell sampling uh, program. So some things to note. Before I had told you computational, everything from, that, from here will be statistical. Right? So this is all statistical adversaries. And I guess one thing to quickly note is that, is that actually the best plain text cell probe lower bound for near neighbor search is actually the static problem via cell sampling. And I believe it's actually the paper that introduced cell sampling many years ago by, I think, uh, Panagrahi, Talwar, and Ryder. OK. All right. So I guess the one thing I'll, I was going to just say is that even to get a log squared and lower bound for near neighbor search required a really strong assumption. So in the previous results, we had considered computational adversaries which are typically the more standard ones. And here, we're assuming statistical adversaries, so all powerful ones. OK, so uh, we're going to use the same. So before I begin, uh, before I go to the oblivious near neighbor search lower bound, I should tell you why the, stat, like the plain text one doesn't work, why it's so difficult, right? Because in fact, it looks like the program should work. We actually have a static cell probe lower bound for near neighbor search, right? So why couldn't we plug it in the same way Hua Cheng had done it for polynomial evaluation and everything? come out and like, it should work, right? Or maybe it should work at first. But um, it turns out it's actually because of the problem itself near neighbor search. Like I mentioned earlier, for polynomial evaluation, it's really easy to come up with hard distributions. In fact, almost all of them are actually hard distributions. But for near neighbor search, this is really not true. So let's look at the chronogram and look at these epochs that are uh, you know, exponentially decaying. So you have all these points that are sort of assigned from different epochs. And what you can do is sort of take a look, you know, s you know, take all the points and divide them according to whichever epoch they occurred in. Remember that the smaller epochs, like the smaller index epochs, are the smaller ones. So if we look at this, you know, this may be on my database of points, and I pick a random query, right? What is the probability that a random query will actually hit one of these small epochs that have a very like, sublinear number of points? Very low probability. In fact, it's almost, it's, pr it's quite small. And this ends up being the biggest problem, actually, to try to use in that program, is the fact that smaller epochs consist of, consist of little o of n points, even like square root n. And if you tried random query points, they'll really discover points from small epochs with very low probability. So in other words, for polynomial evaluation, this is fine, because of any points that I get responses for will give me a way to retrieve all the information that were updated in the coefficients. For near neighbor search, this is not true. OK, so how do we get around this? Um, well, we're going to use obliviousness. Right? And like I said earlier, we're going to try to stitch together different distributions that make this work. So at a very high level, what we're going to do is sort of take the universe that we could put all our spaces in. I think we use a, a, a poly log n uh, Boolean hypercube. Partition them into epochs and you know, give each epoch its own partition. And sort of the updates for each epoch will occur in each little partition. So this sort of solves one problem in the sense that if I pick a random query within this partition, now I know that the random query will hit a point from, from, its, from, from this epoch and none of the other ones, just by the way we have ranged it. 
OK, so it looks like we're done. Uh, not exactly. It turns out that this, this technique could, was the one we also used for the other results for the, for the array. And this only requires computational uh, sort of assumptions. So let's go back to cell sampling. And again, I'm going to sort of refer and compare to polynomial evaluation. So yes, now it's true that random queries for each epoch will discover uh, points even for small epochs. But cell sampling does not guarantee random queries. Right? What does it guarantee? The guarantee is essentially if I have a query space of size q, I know that q divided by n, time, n to the power of little o of one queries are good slash resolved. Right? So again, for polynomial evaluation, this is fine. I don't care what sort of points I get evaluations of. I can interpolate the polynomial back deterministically. I really do care for near neighbor search because, for example, I could get this picture. <laughs> right? If I somehow miss every one of my queries miss, I'm not getting any information. I, I can't prove a lower bound. right? Again, I'm stuck. Right? So in fact, remember that cell sampling it sort of is proof for non-deterministic. So it, it applies for non-deterministic data structures. I think this is one of the sort of manifestations of it, is that it doesn't apply for random. This guarantee the data structure could pick this adversarially. Right? The data structure could say, I'm going to make sure that every single query that is good resolved, the ones that actually let me get information from cell sampling, will, not, will be ones that give you no information about the updates I've given. So this is where we actually had to apply the bigger hammer of statistical obliviousness. So let's look at this picture and, and sort of think about what it tells you. If I sort of have, if I really got into this situation where I was given a bunch of cells, that, a bunch of queries that, were, that, that are considered good by cell sampling, but are missing everything in the, in the universe, well, actually, the union of these queries aren't small, right? So for example, we can apply our favorite isoparametric inequality. And what it says is if I have a bunch of queries that are empty, that don't touch any na uh, neighbors, well, actually, the union of them can cover at least like half the d-dimensional Hamming, like the, of the Hamming cube, right? So actually, even though it looks like we're not getting inf any information, we're actually getting some information, right? We're actually, we're in a, at a very high level, what you can imagine is all of these, these missing points are covering half of the space. So in fact, this is sort of a contradiction now, right? Again, remember that everything here that we're sort of using for the lower bound can be computed by an adversary, right? So in fact, the adversary can figure out all of these queries and, and sort of figure out that they're, that they're empty in a sense. And this is where we apply statistical oblivionness. This is sort of a contradiction now, in the sense that an adversary can somehow find a bunch of queries that are correlated to the database. Even though it's the reverse of what we want, it's still correlated, right? If you always get zeros, it's actually, it's actually correlated. And from this, this is, how, this is how we can sort of say that this can't happen. So I'm not going to go into much uh, detail about how we do this. But essentially, it's like I said, if you assumed that sort of the data structure is statistically oblivious, what that means is the good and resolved queries, just, they just can't all miss. Right? Otherwise, they reveal way too much information about the update points, which we're supposed to hide as well. So we're, remember, we're back in oblivious. So this is oblivious uh, sort of near neighbor search, right, where we have to hide everything. And long story short, what you end up doing is, is if you prove that this data structure is statistically oblivious, it better be that these points and these points don't have high mutual information. Right? So like I said, statistical, distance, uh, statistical adversaries are usually done through statistical distance. But you can use sort of a reverse Pinsker argument to sort of convert statistical distance to mutual information. And if you prove that, if you sort of say this happens, what it ends up happening is you can sort of compress each of these points by one bit less than you should. And that provides a contradiction, essentially. Uh, that's a good question. I actually think that uh, Omri and Omri and Casper know more about this, but it's the way I view it is it's one way to sort of convert arguments for statistical distance to mutual information. Right. Yes, or vice versa. We use that if the statistical distance is small, the mutual information should be small. In general, the squares 
Yeah, I don't. I don't think we use a strong one because this is pretty insensitive to like what yeah. statistical distance it was anyway. So, any any sort of technique that lets you convert this should should theoretically work. Right. No, no, no. So remember, so statistical. If you have a something that's private, a data structure that's private, it's an upper bound on statistical distance, a very small statistical distance. So you can convert it to a very small mutual information, essentially. OK. Um, so, so that's, that's sort of the summary, like another way that we ended up having to use obliviousness, sort of, you know. One way is you can sort of stitch together distributions to sort of get results. And this is more of a computational argument. And in fact, if you end up needing to sort of somehow make queries independent of updates, you can actually use statistical obliviousness, as we had done in this sort of result. Right. So maybe a summary of what that result specifically was is before we had this static near neighbor search problem that requires log n overhead, omega log n. And now we can sort of use the chronogram. I guess I have cell sampling in here as well. And then a very heavy hammer of statistical obliviousness that, w that enables you to get a log squared and lower bound. Right? And sort of we use obliviousness to get around all of the problems that come with sort of the problem near neighbor search being such a sparse, qu like sparse query into a, into a into a database. OK, so one thing that I think Hua Cheng and Omri were talking about last time specifically was something here, and the fact that static near neighbor search, you know, like the best lower bounds we have via cell sampling remain omega log n, right? And the chronogram plus cell sampling is sort of a program that can get you to log squared n. And we sort of have another program that's sort of doing the exact same thing, right? So then there's a natural question now of, so this is one way to do that. This is following exactly the line that we've done sort of done in data structures. But there's actually a, an interesting question here of like, is this the best we could do still? Right now, let's suppose we wanted to do oblivious static near neighbor search, or oblivious static, our favorite problem. Does that still apply? You know, uh, what Hua Cheng and Omri were saying is that if you try to get above omega log n, this has implications towards rigidity, locally decodable codes. And maybe this is a good way to get around this, right? So now I'm going to get back to read only. So when I say read only, Usually, you guys consider static data structures. So let's suppose we have a read-only oblivious RAM. What that means is there's no writes. There's only reads. The reason why I don't call this static data structures is that you still want the data structure to mutate for privacy reasons. So even if you're only doing reads, you still need to refresh keys. You still need to update the server and sort of permute and re-encrypt things just for privacy reasons. You know, if you don't have privacy, it makes sense to consider read-only with the static data structure. But here, we're going to consider sort of a dynamic data structure, but only supporting read operations. OK, so the bad news is uh, there was a result by uh, Moore, Weiss, and Daniel Wicks in 2018 <laughs> sort of that almost mirrors the same result. What it essentially says is sort of proving non-trivial read-only oblivious RAM lower bounds would rule out the existence of either small sorting circuits or very efficient locally decodable codes. So in a sense, even if you tried to do obliviousness to get around the sort of barrier for, for cell sampling or like where static uh, cell probe lower bounds are, unless you really think small sorting circuits isn't a barrier, because that's the only one we add here, you're still sort of stuck in a sense. Um, and one thing I'll mention is that I haven't told you guys about why oblivious RAMs are so powerful. But if you really think about it, all of our computation uses an array at the very lowest level. Right, So there's this idea of oblivious RAM composition. Right? You know, let's suppose I had an oblivious RAM with overhead t of t of a RAM. Then if I have any data structure plain text right, with overhead t in space order n, I can essentially compile it into an oblivious counterpart. Right? And what I do essentially is take every single plain text, every single access to memory that the plain text data structure does, and replace it with an oblivious RAM access. So what happens now is you get a multiplicative overhead. And no, not much additional space, actually. It's actually asymptotically the same. So what does this mean? Corollary-wise, it means even though the, up, the previous result was applied for any sort of for only for read-only oblivious RAMs, what it's really saying is that for any data structure problem, let's suppose the plain text complexity is theta t, then proving a, a omega t. So I'm hiding some log logs here. So there is a little bit to play with here. You could actually maybe theoretically get it up by a log log factor. But sort of circ circumventing this result for any read-only data structure problem, or again, read-only is more powerful than static, because you still have the ability to update the, the data structure. 
would again run into sort of the same problems that we have without obliviousness. So in other words, in many ways, the oblivious land is sort of stuck almost at the same place that the non-oblivious uh, sort of uh, barriers are stuck at. All right, uh, any questions? Yep. So the, this result, which I guess Phil you know, uses the same principle from the Greek, from the Swiss principle. So is the, this is proved by saying, I guess, if you have small sorted circuits and efficient locally decodable code, then you can implement. Exactly, exactly. So it's a exactly, and they achieve it getting like log log, poly log log overhead. So that's why there's a polylog log gap there. And how small are the sorting things? Uh, good question. Um, I think they only require them to be n log log, polylog log, or something like that. Maybe not. Uh, I, don't, I don't exactly remember. Um, in fact, I guess I should also note that there is actually some space below up as well. So for ORAM, it's, it's order n. For this, it's like n polylog log as well. But essentially, they, they, don't, they don't make very strong assumptions on this. These are just slightly beyond what are known, essentially. So like they just use, the, I think you can, you can get their same results by assuming something like n polylog log and sorting circuits. And yeah, maybe by what's a sorting circuit? Maybe I don't know. Uh, so OK, so maybe going back to sort of here. One of the base operations for oblivious rams in their upper bounds is essentially permutations, oblivious permutations. So every once in a while, maybe after a certain set of read and write operations, what happens is the user device will privately generate some permutation, pseudo-randomly, and then do a sort of operation with the server to essentially permute it. But it's done in such a way that the permutation is never learned by the server. And a simple way to implement this is using certain sort of sorting circuits. Well, what is it? Oh, sorting, okay, so you just, so it's a circuit, you just got a, you have an array of inputs and it sorts it for you, the output's sorted. And what are the, uh, you know, I'm just trying, so this is not, a, I think you can have arbitrary gates. Yeah. What? You can have arbitrary gates. Like it's not like a swap gates, it's arbitrary gates. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, but the, the, the data is in binary? So in other words, yeah. what? Yeah. So yeah. And I think, like for sorting circuits, their size n log n ones, AKS, that's that's known, right? So they just assume something in between linear and n log n. This one? Oh, yeah. this one. Yes. So I think th there's, there was a similar title that spurred Casper to write his first paper. So maybe you can solve this one as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, think it was, I think there was a similar, like, similar argument here showing, maybe if people are interested, a similar results holds for like, what are so-called offline ORAMs, where you get all the updates at once, or when you get all the operations at once. So uh, there's an anal analogous result to this by uh, Moni Noor and uh, I think Alep Boyle that proves a similar result. Um, and there, they only need sorting circuits. OK, um, any more questions on this? All right, so I'll move on. I, don't, I think I'm, not, I'm probably running out of time now. So I'm going to talk about the last, last model which we have. So so far, I've really only shown you dynamic data structure lower bounds, right? Everything I've done, even read only, is technically a dynamic data structure. So I want to I show you a simple connection between a static model of data structure lower bounds that can be used in cryptography. So the one I'm going to use it's probably a very, very restricted version of, of data structures that people don't like to study, which is called systematic succinct data structures. And what it really means is the data structure, when you're given the input, you have to store the input as is. You're not allowed to encode it. Like you're given the input, let's say a matrix, and you have to store it exactly as if the matrix was like this. The succinct part is on the side, you get some small additional memory, like a scratch pad, to let you speed up queries into the data structure. So I'm not going to go too much into this. Um, typically, the two, the two uh, computational costs that we care, or the co two costs we care about are space. And when I say space, not this 
because we know this of this, right? So we call that that R. And the query time is denoted by T. And actually, most of the lower bound techniques only bound probes into the input. So you can, you can typically touch all of that for free, because that's where the techniques are at. And the highest lower bound, I believe, is t times r is equal to omega n log n. And this was for some variant of, of OMV, I think, right? Like uh, something like that. They're higher than this? Yeah, so n is the size of the uh, n squared, I think, right? Something like that, OK, yeah. All right. Um, so it turns out that in cryptography, we study something called oracle models. So what are oracle models? You have some oracle that represents a function f. And what happens is you, you submit queries. You know, If you get x, you want f of x. You can think of these as encryption, random hash functions, permutations, random oracles, whatever. And in many problems, actually, what you're trying to do is you have this additional memory. And you want to solve some problem based on the oracle f. And the only thing you're charged are actually requests to f, this oracle. This looks very familiar, right? So uh, let's suppose we took the, the oracle and just wrote it down. All right? Let's say we wrote it down exactly like this, where each entry has f1, f2, f3, f4. And again, now I only charge you for each probe into this input or oracle. Right? This is exactly the systematic succinct data structure. Uh, model. So it turns out there's a connection, I think, between several works of which I'm not sure they, they knew about it from each other, but there's a lot of works in this problem like from, from two or three decades ago. Like in very, very simple ones like inverting random hash fun random functions, random permutations, random oracles, computing discrete logarithms, encryption, decryption, right? How, what are the concrete costs of sort of decrypting a, a, a sort of function? And it turns out that you can, you can sort of uh, you can sort of look at that. And there's a potential that some of the techniques in systematic succinct data structures could end up improving the lower bounds here or, or vice versa. Um, I guess one thing is I worked on a result for something called private information retrieval or preprocessing that's in this sort of Oracle model and where you can obtain, I think, similarly high results. Why is that? Uh, that's missing an N, obviously. So it should be something similar. Um, so I'm not going to go through this. I don't have time. So I think that's the end of the talk. You guys have any questions? Good question, and the answer is I don't know. That's, a, that's an open question that I, I'd like to explore. Um, so a couple of things I would like to, I will say about that is uh, going back to, yeah, okay, even ORAMs, let's say. Remember, the gap we're talking about is polylog. A lot of fine-grained complexity are insensitive to polylogs, right? In fact, what they care about are like, you know, n to the epsilons. So you have to find a problem that sort of, because like, I guess one thing as well is that, like, I think I was talking about oblivious RAM. Uh, this, this composition result, right? If you assume the specific model I have, you almost get it for free, this obliviousness, by a log n factor. Well, say I want to know the shortest path in a map that's in the database, but I don't want the database to know, you know which path I'm looking for. I mean, that would be great. Yeah, so you can do whatever is the plain text, sort of uh, whatever the best plain text data structure or algorithm is, multiply by log n. Uh, OK. Right. Well, yeah, that's right. So fine grain would not, I don't know how you would use fine grain results to sort of differentiate an extra log factor, for example. That's sort of one of the challenges of using fine grain complexity here. Does that make sense? No, sorry, say again. Yeah, so I like like so okay, so what is the best ORAM? It's log n. It's order log n overhead. Right? Not only for read only, but for, for everything. It's duplicative overhead. Yes, yes. Right. Exactly. Overhead. And now if you wanted to try to differentiate the two and prove lower bounds, I didn't know if fine-grain complexity was sensitive enough oh, see, to handle log differences. Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. right. um, and that's one of the big issues is that you have to find a different sort of model where such sensitivities could, 